Section 5 of Null ABC. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Karina Schultz. Null ABC by H. Beam Piper and John J. McGuire. Hutchnecker called to the telephone, spoke briefly listened for a while spoke again in hearty thanks and hung up macy and gimbals he told prestonby they heard about our trouble probably one of their price spotters phoned in about it and they're offering to send twenty of their store cops to help us out they'll be landing on our stage in eight minutes rifles and steel helmets prestonby nodded it would have been quite conceivable that pelton's chief competitor had started the riot since they hadn't their offer of armed aid was just as characteristic of the bitter but mutually respectful rivalries of the commercial world. A few minutes later another call came in, this time on the visiphone. Preston betook it when he saw a literate's guard's officer in the screen and recognized him. "'That you, Prestonby?' the officer, Major Slater, asked in some surprise. "'Didn't know you were at Pelton's. What's going on there?' Prestonby told him, briefly. Yes, we had some of our people at the store, in plain clothes, Slater said, just in case of trouble, on Mr. L.'s orders. They reported a riot starting, but naturally their reports were incomplete. Can you get one of your landing stages cleared for us? We have two hundred men in twenty copters. Then he must have noticed some of the store illiterates back of Prestonby, and realized that this offer of help to literacy's worst enemy would arouse suspicion. Not that we care what happens to Chester Pelton, but we have to protect our own people at the store. Yes, of course, Prestonby agreed. Come in on our north stage. You'll probably find a fight going on on our twelfth floor, just inside. Anybody who's trying to get up the escalators to the office block will be an enemy. Right. We're halfway there now. The literate's guard's officer broke the connection. You heard that? he asked, turning to the others in the office. If we can hold out till they get here, we're all right. Did you contact Radical Socialist headquarters yet, Hutchnecker? Yes, I talked to a fellow named Yingling. He said that all the party storm troops had been lured out to some kind of a disturbance in North Jersey Borough. He'd try to get them recalled. Prestonby swore bitterly. By the time his own party goons get here, the literates' guards and Macy and Gimbals will have pulled Pelton's bacon off the fire for him. Nice friends he has. An alarm buzzer went off suddenly, and an urgent voice came out of the box on the wall. Here come the goons! South Escalator! Prestonby grabbed a burp gun and a canvas musette bag full of clips. By the time he had gotten down to what, in deference to the superstitions of the illiterate store force, was known as the fourteenth floor, an attack on the north escalator had developed as well. In both cases, the attackers seemed to expect no organized resistance. They simply jumped onto the escalators, adding their own running speed, and came rushing up, firing pistols ahead of them at random. The defenders, however, had been ready. The fire hoses caught those in the lead and hurled them back. Some of them vaulted the barrier between the ascending and descending spirals and let themselves be carried down again. Less than five minutes after the buzzer had sounded the warning, the attack stopped. The noise on the twelfth floor increased, however, and, leaning over into the escalator way, Prestonby could see the rioters firing in the direction of the entrance from the north landing stage. Within a matter of thirty seconds, they began to flee, and a wave of literates' guards in their futuristic space cadet uniforms came pouring in after them. Douglas MacArthur Yetzko put the burp gun back together again, tried the action, and laid it aside with a sigh. He had cleaned every weapon in his and Prestonby's private arsenal since lunch, and now he had to admit the unpalatable fact that there was nothing left to do but turn on the TV. Ray had been no company at all. The boy hadn't spoken a word since he'd started rummaging among the captain's books. Gloomily, he snapped on the screen to sample the soap shows. Della's palace was in jail again, this time accused of murdering the lawyer who had gotten her acquitted on a previous murder rap. Considering the fact that she had languished in jail for almost a year during the other trial, Yetzko felt that she had a sound motive. Rudolph Barstow, in Broadway Wife, was, like Bruce's spider, 
spinning his five hundredth web to ensnare the glamorous marie novel and there was a show about a schoolteacher and her class of angelic little tots that almost brought yetzko's lunch up he shifted the dial again a young literate announcer was speaking quickly excitedly scene of the riot already the worst this year and growing steadily worse we take you now to downtown manhattan where our portable units and commentators have just arrived and switch you to ed morgan the screen went black and yetzko swore angrily ray lifted his head quickly from his book and reached for the sono pistol yetzko had given him good afternoon ladies and gentlemen and just a moment until we can give you the picture we're having what is usually labeled as slight technical difficulties in this case the difficulty of avoiding having a hole shot in our camera or in your commentator's head yes that's shooting you here there somebody's using an auto rifle how are you coming steve a voice muttered something which two centuries ago would have caused an earth-shaking scandal in the whole radio tv industry well till steve gets things fixed up a brief review to date of what's sure to go down in history as the battle of pelton's purchaser's paradise huh ray fairly shouted the book forgotten started in the chinaware department as a relatively innocent brawl and spread to the liquor department and then all of a sudden everybody started playing rough at first it was suspected that macy and gimbals had sent a goon gang around to break up pelton's fall sale but when the former concern rallied to the assistance of their competitor with a force of twenty riflemen that began to look less likely and we're beginning to think that it might be the work of some of pelton's political enemies about ten minutes ago major james f slater of the literates guards arrived with two hundred of his men to protect the literates on duty at the store they captured the entire twelfth floor where we are now with the exception of the ladies lingerie and hosiery departments around one of the escalators to the lower floors here the gang who started the riot and who are now donning white hoods to distinguish themselves from the various other factions involved have thrown up barricades of counters and display tables and are fighting bitterly to keep control of the escalator head ah here we are the screen lit suddenly and they were looking ray over yetzko's shoulder across the devastated expanse of what had been the ladies frocks department toward lingerie and hosiery which seemed to have been thoroughly looted then stripped of everything that could be used to build a barricade seems to have been quite a number of heavy copters just landed on the east stage filled with more goons probably to reinforce the gang back of that barricade the firing's gotten noticeably heavier yetzko had turned from the screen and was pawing in the arms locker for a job like this he'd need firepower he took the ten-shot clip from the butt of his pistol and inserted one with a curling one hundred shot drum at the bottom and shoved two more like it into the pockets of his jacket and now something to clear the way with he took out a three-foot length of weighted fire hose then he saw ray that kid was pinning him down here while the captain was probably fighting for his life but the captain told him to stay with ray he dropped the weighted hose what's the matter doug the boy asked pick it up and let's get going he shook his head can't the captain told me i had to take care of you the boy opened his mouth to speak closed it again and thought for a moment then he asked doug didn't captain prestonby tell you to stay with me yes all right you do just that because i'm going to help claire and the senator that's who that goon gang's after yetzko considered the proposition for a moment horrified why this was the captain's girl's kid brother if anything happened to him his mind refused to contemplate what the captain would do to him no you gotta stay here ray he said the captain then his eye caught the screen ed morgan must have found a place where he could run his camera up on an extension rod from behind something they were looking down from almost ceiling height at the barricade and at the literate guards who were firing from cover at it a sudden blast of automatic weapons burst from the barricade more men in white hoods came boiling up the escalator and they all rushed forward the few literates guards skirmishers were overwhelmed he saw one of them a man he knew sam ego from company five go down wounded he saw one of the white hooded goons pause to brain him with a carbine butt before charging on why you dirty rotten illiterate 
he roared, retrieving his weighted hose. Come on, Ray, let's go. Ray hesitated, as though in thought. Ken Dorchin, Harry Cobb, Dick Hirschfield, Jerry McCarty, Ramon Nogales, Pete Shawnee, Tom Hutchinson. Ooh, Yetzko began. What have they got to do with... We need a gang. The two of us last about as long as a pint of beer at a Dutch picnic. Ray went to the desk, grabbed a pen, and made a list of names, in a fair imitation of Ralph Prestonby's neat block printing. Give this to the girl outside and tell her to have them called for and sent in here, the boy directed. And see if you can find us some transport. I think there ought to be a couple of big copters finished down at the shops. And if you can find a couple more literate guards you can talk into going with us. Yetzko nodded and took the paper without question. He was not, and he would be the first to admit it, of the thinking type. He was a good sergeant, but he had to have an officer to tell him what to do. Ray Pelton might be only fifteen years old, but his sister was the captain's girl, and that put him in the officer class. A very young and recently commissioned second lieutenant, say, but definitely an officer. Yetzko took the list and looked at it. Like most literate guards, he could read after a fashion. He recognized the names. The boys were all members of the top-floor secret society. He went out and gave the list to Martha Collins. He had expected some argument with her, but she seemed to accept Ray Pelton's printing as Prestonby's. She began checking room charts and class lists and calling for the boys to be sent at once to the office. He went out and down to the copter repair shop, where he found that a big four-ton air truck that the senior class had been working on for several weeks was finished. Yes, I had it up myself this morning. Flew it over to the Bronx and back with a load of supplies. Okay, have somebody you can trust, one of your guards preferably. Bring it around behind the administration wing. Captain Prestonby wants it. I'm to take some boys from fourth-year civics on a tour. Something about election campaign methods. The instructor called a literate's guard and gave him instructions. Yetzko went to the guard's squad room on the second floor, where he found half a dozen of the reserves loafing. All right, you guys start earning your pay, he said. We're going to a party. The men got to their feet and began gathering their weapons. Mason, he continued, you have your big copter here. The gang of you can all get in it. I'm taking off in a four-ton truck with some of these kids. I want you boys to follow us. We're going to Pelton's store. There's a fight going on there, and the captain's in the middle of it. We gotta get him out. They all looked at him in puzzled surprise, but nobody gave him any argument. Funny, now that he thought of it, it had been quite a long time since anybody had ever given him any argument about anything. A couple of guys out in Pittsburgh had tried it, but somehow they'd lost interest in arguing after a little... When he returned to the office and opened the door, a blast of shots greeted him through the open door of Preston B.'s private office. He had his pistol out before he realized that the shooting was going on at Pelton's Purchaser's Paradise ten miles away. Literate Martha Collins in the inner room was fairly screaming, "'Shut that infernal thing off and listen to me!' The dozen odd boys whom Ray had recruited for the improvised relief expedition were pulling weapons out of the gun locker, pawing through the boxes on the ammunition shelf, trying to explain to one another the working of the machine carbines and burp guns. Yetzko shouldered through them and turned down the sound volume of the TV. "'This is absolutely outrageous!' literate Martha Collins stormed at him. "'You ought to be ashamed of yourself, taking these children to a murderous battle like that!' Well, maybe it ain't right using savages in a civilized riot, Yetzko admitted, but I don't care. The captain's in a jam, and I'd use live devils if I could catch a few. He took a burp gun from one of the boys, who had opened the action and couldn't get it closed again. Here, you kids don't want this kind of stuff, he reproved. Sano guns and sleep gas guns, that's all right, but these things are killing tools. It's what we have to use, Doug, Ray told him. Things have been happening since you went out. Look at the screen. Yetzko looked and swore blisteringly. Then he gave the burp gun back to the boy. Look, you gotta press this little gizmo here to let the action shut when there's no clip in or when the clip's empty. When you got a loaded clip in, you just pull back on this and let go.
Frank Carden looked at his watch and saw that it was 13.45, as it had been ten seconds before, when he had last looked. He started to drum nervously on his chair arm with his fingers, then caught himself as he saw Lansdale, who must have been every bit as anxious as himself, standing outwardly calm and unruffled. "'Well, that's the situation which now confronts us, Brother Literates,' the slender, white-haired man was finishing. "'You must see by now that the policy of unyielding opposition of which some of you have advocated and pursued is futile. You know the policy I favor, which now remains the only policy we can follow.' It is summed up in that law of political strategy. If you can't lick em, join em, and, after joining, take control. In spite of the radical socialist victory in this state at tomorrow's election, it will not be possible in the next Congress to enact Pelton's socialized literacy program into law. The radicals will not be able to capture enough seats in the lower house, and there are too many uncontested seats in the Senate now held by independent conservatives. But, and this is inevitable, barring some unforeseen accident of the order of a political cataclysm, they will control both houses of Congress after the election of 2144, two years hence, and we can also be sure that two years hence, Chester Pelton will be nominated and overwhelmingly elected president of the Consolidated States of North America. Six months thereafter, the socialized literacy program will be the law of the land. So. We have until mid-2145 to make our preparations. I would estimate that, if we do not destroy ourselves by our own folly in the meantime, we should, two years thereafter, be in complete, if secret, control of the whole consolidated state's government. If any of you question that last statement, you can merely ask yourselves one question. How, in the name of all that is rational, can illiterates control and operate a system of socialized literacy? Who but literates can keep such a program from disintegrating into complete and indescribable confusion? I don't ask for any decision at this time. I do not ask for any debate at this time. Let each of us consider the situation in his or her own mind, and let us meet again a week from today to consider our future course of action, each of us realizing that any decision we take then will determine forever the fate of our fraternities. He looked around the room. "'Thank you, Brother Literates,' he said. Instantly, Cardin was on his feet with a motion to recess the meeting until 1300 the following Monday, and Brigade Commander Chernoff seconded the motion immediately. As soon as Literate President Moorhead's gavel banged, Cardin, still on his feet, was running for the double doors at the rear. The two Literates' guards on duty there got them unsealed and opened by the time he had reached them. There was another guard in the hall, waiting for him with a little record desk. For Major Slater, call came in about ten minutes ago, he said. Cardin snapped the disc into his recorder reproducer and put in the earplug. Frank, Slater's voice came out of the small machine. You'd better get busy or you won't have any candidate when the polls open tomorrow. Just got a call from Pelton's store. Place infiltrated by goons. Estimated strength, two hundred. Presumed independent conservatives. Serious rioting already going on. I'm taking my reserve company there, and if you haven't found out yet where China is, it's on the third floor, next to glassware. Cardin pulled out the earplug, stuffed the recorder into his trouser pocket, and began unbuckling his Sam Brown as he ran for the nearest wall visiphone. He was dialing the guard room on that floor with one hand as he took off the belt. Get a big ambulance on the roof, with a literate medic and orderly driver, he ordered, unbuttoning his smock and four guards plain clothes if possible but don't waste time changing clothes if you don't have anybody out of uniform heavy-duty sono guns sleep gas projectors gas masks and pistols hurry he threw the smock and belt at the guard here poncho put these away for me thanks he tossed the last word back over his shoulder as he ran for the escalator it was three eternal minutes after he had reached the landing stage above before the ambulance arrived medic and orderly on the front seat and the four guards all in conservatively cut civilian clothes inside he crowded in beside the medic told him pelton's store and snapped the door shut as the big white copter began to rise they climbed to five thousand feet and then the driver nosed his vehicle up cut his propeller and retracted it and fired his rocket aiming toward downtown manhattan four minutes later 
After the rocket stopped firing and they were on the down curve of their trajectory, the propeller was erected and they began letting down toward the central landing stage of Pelton's Purchaser's Paradise. Cardin cut in the TV and began calling the control tower. "'Ambulance! To evacuate Mr. Pelton!' he called. "'What's the score down there?' One of Pelton's traffic control men appeared on Cardin's screen. "'You're safe to land on the central stage, but you'd better come in at a long angle from the north,' he said. We control the north public stage, but the east and south stages are in the hands of the goons. They'd fire on you. Land beside that big pile of boxes under tarpaulins up here. But be careful. It's fireworks we didn't have time to get into storage. The ambulance came slanting in from uptown, and Cardin looked around anxiously. The mayfly dance of customers' copters had stopped. There was a Sabbath stillness about the big store, at least visually. A few small figures in literate guards' black leather moved about on the north landing stage, and several Pelton employees were on the central stop stage. The howling of the copter propeller overhead effectively blocked out any sounds that might be coming from the building, at least until the ambulance landed. Then a spatter of firing from below was audible. Cardin, the medic, and the guards piled out, the latter with the stretcher. The orderly driver got out his tablet pistol and checked the chamber, then settled into a posture of watchful relaxation. Major Slater was waiting for them by one of the vertical lift platforms. I tried to get hold of you, but that blasted meeting was going on, and they had the door sealed, and— he began. Cardin hushed him quickly. Around here, I'm an illiterate, he warned. Where's Pelton? We've got to get him and his daughter out of here, at once— "'He's still flat on his back, out cold,' Slater said. "'The medic you sent around here gave him a shot of hypnotane. "'He'll be out for a couple of hours yet. "'Prestonby's still here. "'He's commanding the defense, doing a good job, too. And "'That was good. "'Ralph would help get Claire to Literates Hall "'after they'd gotten her father to safety. "'There must be about five hundred independent conservative stormtroopers in the store,' "'Slater was saying. "'Most of them got here after we did.' The city cops have all the street approaches roped off. They're letting nobody but Grant Hamilton's thugs in. They were fairly friendly this morning, Cardin said. Mayor Jameson must have passed the word. They all got off the lift two floors down, where they found Claire Pelton and Ralph Prestonby waiting. Hello, Ralph. Claire, what's the situation? We have all of the twelfth floor, Prestonby said. We have about half the eleventh, including the north and west public stages. We have the basement and the storerooms and the warehouse. Sergeant Calcazello's down there with as many of the store police and literates and literates guards and store help as he could salvage, and the warehouse gang. They've taken most of the ground floor, the main mezzanine, and parts of the second floor. We moved two of the seven-millimeter machine guns down from the top, and we control the front street entrance with them and a couple of sono guns. The stores isolated from the outside by the city police, who are allowing reinforcements to come through for the raiders, but we're managing to stop them at the doors. Have you called Radical Socialist Headquarters for help? Yes, half a dozen times. There's some fellow named Yingling there who says that all their storm troops are over in North Jersey on some kind of false alarm riot call and can't be contacted. So, Cardin commented gently, that's too bad now. Too bad for Horace Yingling and Joe West. This time tomorrow, there'll be a pair of dead traitors, he thought. Well, we'll have to make do with what we have. Where's Russ Letterman, by the way? Prestonby gave a sidewise glance toward Claire and shook his head, his lips pressed tightly together. She doesn't know yet, Cardin interpreted. Down in the basement with Calcazello, Prestonby said aloud. We're in telephone communication with Calcazello and have a freight elevator running between here and the basement. Calcazello says Ladderman is using a rifle against the raiders, killing everyone he can get a shot at. Cardin nodded. Probably vindictive about being involved in an action injurious to Pelton's commercial interests. Just another odd quirk of literate ethics. We'd better get him up here, he said. You and I have got to leave at once. We have to get Pelton and Claire to safety. He can help Major Slater till we can get back with reinforcements. I am going to kill a man named Horace Yingling, and then I am going to round up the storm troops he diverted on a wild goose chase to North Jersey. He nodded to the medic and the four plainclothes guards. Get Pelton on the stretcher. 
Better use the canvas flaps and the straps. He's under hypnotane, but it's likely to be a rough trip. Claire, get anything you want to take with you. Ralph will take you to where you'll be safe for a while. But the store, Claire began. Your father has riot insurance, doesn't he? I know he does. They doubled the premium on him when he came out for Senate. Let the insurance company worry about the store. The medic and the guards moved into Chester Pelton's private rest room with the stretcher. Claire went to the desk and began picking up odds and ends, including the pistol Cardin had given her, and putting them into her handbag. "'We've got to keep her away from her father for a few days, Ralph,' he told Prestonby softly. "'It's all over town that she can read and write. We've got to give him a chance to cool off before he sees her again. Take her to Lansdale. I have everything fixed up. She'll be admitted to the fraternities this afternoon and given literate protection.' Prestonby grabbed his hand impulsively. "'Frank, I'll never be able to repay you for this, not if I live to be a thousand. he began. There was a sudden blast of sound from overhead, the banging of machine guns, the bark of the store's twenty-millimeter autocannon, the howling of airplane jets, and the crash of explosions. Everybody in the room jerked up and stood frozen. Then Prestonby jumped for the TV screen and pawed at the dials. A moment later, after the screen flashed and went black twice, they were looking across the topside landing stage from a pickup at one corner. A slim fighter-bomber, with square-tipped, back-swept wings, was jetting up in almost perpendicular flight. Another was coming in toward the landing stage, and, as they watched, a flight of rockets leaped forward from under its wings. Cardin saw the orderly driver of the ambulance jump down and start to run for the open lift shaft. He got five steps away from his vehicle. Then the rockets came in, and one of them struck the tarpaulin-covered pile of boxes beside the ambulance. There was a flash of multicolored flame in which the man and the vehicle he had left both vanished. Immediately the screen went black. The fireworks had mostly exploded at the first blast. However, when Cardin and Major Slater and one or two others reached the top landing stage, there were still explosions. A thing the size and shape of a two-gallon kettle covered with red paper came rolling toward them, and suddenly let go with a blue-green flash, throwing a column of smoke, in miniature imitation of an A-bomb, into the air. Something about three feet long came whizzing at them on the end of a tail of fire, causing them to fling themselves flat. Involuntarily, Cardin's head jerked about, and his eyes followed it until it blew up with a flash and a bang three blocks uptown. Here and there, colored fire flared, small rockets flew about, and firecrackers popped. The ambulance was gone, blown clear off the roof. The other copters on the landing stage were a tangled mass of wreckage. The twenty-millimeter was toppled over, the gunner was dead, and one of the crew, half-dazed, was trying to drag a third man from under the overturned gun. The control tower, with the two twelve-millimeter machine guns, was wrecked. The two seven-millimeters that had been left on the top had vanished, along with the machine gunners, in a hole that had been blown in the landing stage. Cardin, Slater, and the others dashed forward and pulled the autocannon off the injured man, hauling him and his companion over to the lift. The two rakish-winged fighter-bombers were returning, spraying the roof with machine-gun bullets, and behind them came a procession of fifteen big copters. They dropped the lift hastily. Slater jumped off when it was still six feet above the floor, and began shouting orders. Falk, take ten men and get to the head of this lift shaft. Burdick, Levine, get as many men as you can in thirty seconds, and get up to the head of the escalator. Diaz, go down and tell Sternberg to bring all his gang up here. Cardin caught up a rifle and rummaged for a bandolier of ammunition, losing about a minute in the search. The delay was fortunate. When he got to the escalators, he was met by a rush of men hurrying down the ascending spiral, or jumping over onto the descending one. "'Sono guns!' one of them was shouting. "'They have the escalator head covered. You'll get knocked out before you get off the spiral.' He turned and looked toward the freight lift. It was coming down again, with Falk and his men unconscious on it, knocked senseless by bludgeons of inaudible sound, and a half a dozen of the copter-borne raiders, all wearing the white robes and hoods of the independent conservative storm troops. He swung his rifle up and began squeezing the trigger, remembering to first make sure that the fire control lever was set forward for semi-auto, and remembering his advice to Goodkin that morning. 
By the time the platform had stopped, all the men in white robes were either dead or wounded, and none of the unconscious literate guards along with them had been injured. The medic who had come with Cardin, assisted by a couple of the office force, got the casualties sorted out. There was nothing that could be done about the men who had been sano-stunned. In half an hour or so, they would recover consciousness, with no ill effects that a couple of headache tablets wouldn't set right. The situation, while bad, was not immediately desperate. If the white-clad raiders controlled the top landing stage, they were pinned down by the firearms and sono-guns of the defenders below, who were in a position to stop anything that came down the escalators or the lift shaft. The fate of the first party was proof of that. And the very magnitude of the riot guaranteed that somebody on the outside, city police, state guards, or even consolidated states' regulars, would be taking a hand shortly. The air attack and copter landing on the roof had been excellent tactics, but it had been a serious policy blunder. As long as the disturbance had been confined to the interior of the store, the city police could shrug it off as another minor riot on property supposed to be protected by private police and do nothing about it. The rocket attack on the top landing stage and the spectacular explosion of the fireworks temporarily stored there, however, was something that simply couldn't be concealed or dismissed. The cloud of vari-colored smoke alone must have been visible all over the five original boroughs of the older New York, and there were probably rumors of atom bombing going around. "'What gets me,' Slater, who must have been thinking about the same thing, said to Cardin, "'is where they got hold of those two fighter-bombers. That kind of stuff isn't supposed to be in private hands.' "'A couple of hundred years ago they had something they called the Sullivan Law,' Cardin told him. Private citizens weren't even allowed to own pistols, but the gangsters and hoodlums seemed to be able to get hold of all the pistols they wanted, and burp guns, too. I know of four or five rocket gangs in this area that have aircraft like that, based up in the Adirondacks, at secret fields. Anybody who has connections with one of those gangs can order an air attack like this, on an hour's notice, if he's able to pay for it. What I can't understand is the independent conservatives doing anything like this, the facts about this business will be all over the state before the polls open tomorrow. He snapped his fingers suddenly. Come on, let's have a look at those fellows who came down on the lift. There were two dead men in white independent conservative robes and hoods, lying where they had been dragged from the lift platform. Cardin pulled off the hoods and zipped open the white robes. One of the men was a complete stranger. The other, however, was a man he had seen earlier in the day at the Manhattan headquarters of the Radical Socialist Party, one of the Consolidated Illiterates Organization people, a follower of West and Yingling. So that's how it was, he said, straightening. Now I get it. Let's go see if any of those wounded goons are in condition to be questioned. End of Section 5